we'll introduce the speaker for uh, uh, for a couple of uh, of minutes and then uh, presenting uh, somehow introducing him based on uh, on the uh, on the bio uh, he had and uh, and then uh, we'll leave him the stage so the speaker of today is uh, Javier Jimenez uh, he's a professor of fluid mechanics at the school of aeronautics and uh, he is currently a distinguished research professor at the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid in uh, Spain. Uh, he received his uh, PhD in uh, applied mathematics and at, uh, at Caltech uh, in uh, 1973. Uh, he had been a visiting fellow at uh, Kaplan Institute of Theoretical Physics uh, uh, in uh, 2016 and at the Sydney Sussex College in 2015. Uh, between uh, 1989 and uh, uh, 2012, he joined the CTR Turbulence uh, Research Center uh, at the University of Stanford and as a senior research fellow. Uh, and uh, from 1999 uh, uh, and uh, uh, from 1999 to 2005, and he held the position of uh, professor of mechanics at Ecole Polytechnique uh, in uh, France. Among the several national and international awards, he received an annual prize uh, of the Spanish Academy of Science, a biennial uh, fluid mechanics prize at Euromec, and since 2005, he's a member of the Spanish Academy of Engineering, and since 2008, he's a member of the Spanish Academy of Science. He was awarded of three European Research uh, Council advanced grants uh, from uh, 2011 to 2015, 2016 to 2021, and from 2021 to 2026. He co-authored more than 140 international referee journal papers, nine books and lecture notes, and 95 among invited lectures and book chapters. So the topic of today is collective structure in uh, two-dimensional turbulence. It's with great, great pleasure that uh, uh, I introduce Javier Fienes for his talk. So Javier, I stop sharing my screen and I leave you the stage. Okay. So let's see if I can... Okay, can you see my screen now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, fantastic. So thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity of giving this, this, this talk. In Lille, without going to Lille, I like Lille, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I cannot be there. But. Okay, so the, 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 the subject of the talk is this thing about collective structures in two-dimensional two turbulence. And there is a second, a second subject, which is... Uh, why? Okay. So I'm, no, no, not only I'm going to speak about the collective structure, but also on how to find it, because I think that's beginning to be more interesting than the, the, the two-dimensional turbulence itself. Okay. Uh, let, let me tell you the, the history of this, of this business for me. Uh, as, 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 as you know, computers are getting faster. I mean, this is something that has been true for all my lifetime, for all my, my career. And they have been getting a lot faster. I mean, during my career of say 50 years, computers have, been, have become faster by a factor of 10 to the 12. Now, 10 to the 12 is a serious number. It's, a, it's almost an astronomical number. It is the diameter, the radius of the, of the solar system in meters. So it's, something, it's, I mean, it's something really big. So computers have become really fast. And then I asked myself, what? What would I do with an infinitely fast computer? I mean, assuming that, for some purpose, the computer becomes infinitely fast. I can ask, for a, ask a question and get the, the answer immediately or within a minute or something. What would be the question? I mean, what would you do in a, in a case like that? Okay. And then uh, this is how I just went back to the problem of two-dimensional turbulence, because it's one of these, one of these uh, subjects which is basically free now. Uh, to do a, a reasonable simulation of two-dimensional turbulence takes something like 30 seconds in a um, GPU or something like that. And also it's, it's an interesting flow. It's an interesting flow because although there are not many two-dimensional flows in, on Earth, there are thin flows which are almost two-dimensional for some scale. And the, the, the clearest example is the, is the geophysical turbulence, things like the ocean which is like three kilometers deep and 10,000 kilometers wide. So it's basically two, two, two dimensional. So it has a problem. The problem with two dimensional turbulence is that we know almost everything. So there is, there is not this, this question of uh, 
what would be my question if there is no question to be asked. But uh, I, mean, I mean, basically what people agree in the 1990s is that two-dimensional turbulences is a vortex gas. I mean, you put vorticity in a, in a double periodic box, as, 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 such like this, you let it go, then the vorticity concentrates into these uh, vortex cores and these vortex cores then interact with each other as almost as if they were atoms or, or molecules, something like that. So, and okay, that's supposed to be it, okay, more or less. Now, whenever something is almost everything, no, there's always an almost. The almost in this case is, well, I mean, the reason, for me, the reason why to measure turbulence is, is, is interesting, at least personally for me, and not being a geophysicist, is, is a paper by John Sager that he, he wrote. Um, Sager, those of you who don't know, one of the founding fathers of statistical mechanics, or at least one of the big gurus of statistical mechanics in the 1940s, 1930s, okay? And he wrote a paper on uh, gas, gases of point vortices in, in two uh, dimensions. And the paper actually had more things, but essentially he was, speaking, he, he was talking about this. And uh, this happens to be a Hamiltonian system, okay? And if it is a Hamiltonian system, then you can do uh, statistical physics. And he noticed that because of the way this particular Hamiltonian system works, if you put enough energy in there, at some point the temperature will become negative. And if you have a positive temperature, we know that when we, you heat a, a gas, you become more and more disordered. If you have a negative temperature, the, the gas will tend to get more, more order and it will get, try, try to create this large scale. And how this thing creates the, the large scale is the thing that was interesting for him. And it's actually the, the thing that got me interested first in this, this question of, of to determine. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens, what happens in, in real life is not that. Is I mean, is, you, you don't get You, you really don't get a uh, negative temperature because it's an atomic system. Real turbulence is a viscous system, but there is something left. Basically, if you have this, this, will, this is supposed to be the spectrum of, of a two dimensional turbulent flow. Here you have the, the energy, and here you have the wave number. So the small things are here, large things are there. And if you force somewhere in, in between, the vorticity goes to one side and the energy goes to. to, to to, to the other. This reverse flow of energy, which is something that has been observed, uh, is what is left of this negative temperature uh, state of, of turbulence. Okay. And the, the thing is the, this forward flow, forward cascade of vorticity, something that is uh, reasonably well understood, is these vortices uh, grinding against each other and uh, uh, they, I mean, uh, destroying each other, stretching each other out. But this negative energy cascade has never been very clear. So this is something that, when something that is, is not clear, then you have something that is almost known and you have a question and the question is whether you can get the computer answer that question for you. And uh, well, how, do, how, how would you use a computer to study the inverse cascade? And this is when I, Essentially, how do you use a free computer or something that is infinitely fast computer to study the, 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 the inverse cascade? This is something that I call Monte Carlo science, which is something that has been, I, I've been interested in this for the past two, three years. Okay? And basically, you, you get it. You have the system and then you have all these structures and say, well, some of these things have to be responsible for the inverse cascade. And the things which are responsible for the future of the system, I would call them causal structure. These are the causes and the future of the, of the flow are the, 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 the effects. And if, if I want to know which ones of these are causes and which ones are, are not, well, I have my free computer, so I take this structure, take it out or change it, see whether something happens to, to, to the flow. If something happens to, to the flow, this thing is a good cause, okay? If something doesn't happen to the, to the flow, this thing is, is irrelevant. Okay. And I do that for all the structures that I have in there. And I repeat the experiment many times and then do a statistics on that. Okay. This sounds expensive and it is expensive. I mean, this, this is, this slide is beginning to get old. And the first time I use it, I had, I had done a two million 
simulations of two-dimensional turbulence to play this game. And every time I give it, I want to do a new slide and then I do another million and the whole thing takes a week. So it's something that, that can be, can be, I mean, can be done because this thing is free, okay? So what do we get? Well, I mean, there is a lot of, between the previous slides and this one, there is a lot of uh, statistics, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, basically uh, bookkeeping, okay? You have to do this and you have to be able to distinguish between things and that. So essentially what you do is you test all the structures in there or you test, if you break your, your flow in little pieces, test all the pieces, uh, make a list of all the pieces which are conditional and then look at what is common to all those pieces which are, which are uh, causal, okay? And you, you, you do a conditionally average flow on being causal, okay? And the, the first thing, the, the, the first time I did that, I, I got something that was not very, 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 very exciting. I got a vortex, okay? Remember, we knew that turbulence is a vortex gas, so vortices are supposed to be important. But this, this is okay. I mean, I was not completely unhappy because, you know, I was dancing something that looked completely stupid. Just use your computer to throw it to a, to, to a, to, 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 to flow to a problem. Basically telling, okay, well, find something and you find something that looks interesting then, okay? And um, well, the, the computer got something that at least was conventional wisdom. So I wrote this little little paper in the journal of mechanics, this rapid, saying, well, Monte Carlo science, this basically do science brute force, is able to reproduce conventional wisdom, which is, 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 is interesting. But then uh, at that time, uh, somebody read this paper and asked me whether you write a longer paper than this for, for a different journal. So I look at my data again through a little, another medium simulation, look at different perturbations, different things to do to, to these, little, these little pieces of the, of the flow. Then the computer came up with another suggestion. Say, okay, well, vortices are okay. There is another, another thing that you might want to look at, which is uh, vortex pairs, dipoles. Okay? These things also influence the future of the flow. Okay? And this is less well known. It's not that dipoles were completely unknown. Uh, uh, there are many papers on dipoles. Actually, I have several papers on dipoles. Uh, for the physical people, call it models. They even have a, a formal name for them. Okay? Uh, but something that I was not able to find these many papers saying, well, the dipoles are the things that control the flow. Dipoles were more like a consequence of the flow. But here was the computer telling me, no, 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 look at them because they seem to control the flow. At least in part, the part of the flow, they seem to, 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 to control the flow. And then that was monitoring to me and I essentially, basically wrote this paper again for the, for this other journal, this longer paper with more statistics, more, um, details on how to do these things. And basically the conclusion is, well, Monte Carlo is not only able to, to discover conventional wisdom, it's also able to suggest some conventional wisdom, something new. Basically the computer was able to discover something, okay? Not completely, I mean, not very, not very, not very well. I mean, it was not telling me, well, this is what the typos do, but it was telling me, well, the typos do something. And so I had to, to think again and, thought for a couple of years, and it was conventional thinking, I mean, it was not computer thinking. And then I ended up with these two, two papers, which is what I'm going to tell you uh, in the first part of the talk today, okay? So what was the conclusion of this suggestion by the, by the computer that I should look at dipoles? Well, you look at dipoles, you look, look at the flow, look where the dipoles are, look at, where they are, I mean, look at how many there are and how big they are and blah, blah, blah. And of course, the dipoles are made out of vortices, okay? And uh, there are many vortices into a mess of turbulence and then you, you, you start playing with that, okay? And I say, okay, well, it turns out that there is not only a single class of vortices into a mess of turbulence, there are two classes, there are small vortices and there are large vortices, okay? But you can, the, the easiest way to, to distinguish them is to look at the distribution of sizes or the distribution of circulation in this case, okay? And there are two, two parts of the histogram 
of the distribution of vortex size. Okay? There are uh, part of the histogram, the, the small vortices that follow a power law. And when you see something that follows a power law, then you say, okay, well, this is probably something that is similar. There is no, if there is a power law, there is no length scale, there is no scale in this, in this system. There has to be something like a well, two vortex size one, they form a vortex size two, two vortex size two form a vortex size, or size four. And the vortices don't know where they're coming from or where they're going, they just know that the size is two. Okay? So this is one kind of vortex, and you can see them here, there are all these small guys. Actually, most vortices are, are, are small vortices, okay? But there are a few, uh, it's something that has a thousand vortices, maybe 10%, right? like a hundred big vortices. And the, the, the distribution of these big vortices are not, it's not a power law, it's, it's an exponential. Exponentials, they need a scale because you cannot put a, 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 dimension, a dimensional number in the, in the, in the exponent, you need a, a, a preferred vortex size, okay, which is actually the mean value of the, 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 the exponential. And what it's telling you is that these vortices, if they're being created, they're being created by accreting vortices of size one. Actually, when you look at the time history of this, what's happening is this uh, similar cascade of vortices uh, is creating vortices which are bigger and bigger. But when they reach something like this point, they get absorbed into the, the smaller uh, population of, of large vortices, which do something else. Okay? And they, they do something else. I mean, when you look at the, what these vortices are doing, when you look at the dynamics of this, these two families of vortices, they're different. Okay? And they're, they're, they're quite different. You look at, uh, for example, what you have in this plot here is, here you have the fraction of the kinetic energy of the flow that is carried by large vortices or small vortices. Okay? Essentially, you take this flow, keep only the large vortices, look at the kinetic energy of the flow, or keep only the small vortices and look at the kinetic energy of the flow. You keep only the small vortices, there is no kinetic energy left. I mean, most of the kinetic energy is in the large vortices. Okay? And this is this axis. This axis here is the vortex mobility. How fast are they moving? How fast are they going? From one place to, to another, has, how fast are they being carried by the by by by, by flow? And you see the small vortices, they act like a vortex gas. I mean, they move quite fast, but they carry no kinetic energy. Okay. The large vortices, they have all the kinetic energy and they're moving slowly, or at least comparatively slowly with respect to the to the RMS velocity of the, of the flow. If you look at where the dipoles are, all the all the dipoles are in this in these uh, large vortices that are made of large vortices, things like this, these two things here, these two things there, this, what is this narrative here, okay? And they, because they are not moving, they have to be seeing each other. They have to see each other because otherwise they will move. I mean, you just, you just put a, a dipole, a dipole moves, uh, uh, moves, moves very fast. These vortices move, these vortices, these vortices move, that vortices and quite space. But they are not moving. So they have to be, the whole thing has to be locked into something like a, Superstructure, okay, and uh, then okay, what was it? Superstructure, so the superstructure is something like this, okay. These are only the large vortices. I've taken, you know, I've taken out one of these uh, flow fields, thrown away all the all the small all the small vortices. These are only the large vortices for this particular case, okay. And when you look at the velocity induced by these large vortices. What they are doing, they are creating these long streamers, these long streams. Uh, when you see here, this, I don't know what you can see in your screen, this little arrow, this is the velocity. And the places where the color is light is because the, the, the velocity is, is, is high. The places where you the velocity, the, the, the color is blue, is because the velocity is basically zero. Okay? So you, you create these long streamers. And this is the inverse cascade. I mean, we have suddenly created something that is a large scale. Okay, you have these small vortices. The small, the small dipoles are still small, okay? But the energy is not in there. The energy is in these, these long streamers, which are a concatenation of dipoles, basically, okay? And uh, actually, that gives you a, a very nice picture of the inverse cascade, because which is the connection between these small dipoles and these large scales? Well, assume that you have a dipole here, and it's part of this large streamer. You block, you block this dipole, you essentially uh, stop the river. You, you strip the, you, you stop the, the, the whole, the whole length of the streamer because there is no flow going through there. Okay, so there is nothing, there is nothing left. I mean, you, you have stopped the large scale structure just by acting on the small scale. 
and the 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 the, the, the range of the inverse cascade is essentially the elongation of these streams. So why are these things going this? Why, why are these vortices, these large vortices, why are they organizing themselves into, into, um, into streams? Well, the, what they're doing, they're trying to minimize energy, which is something that is, is fairly common in, in something like a dissipative system, like the like turbulence, okay? They try to get rid of the energy. And uh, you, can, you can do that by checking Assume that you have a, a system like this, you have my, my, all the all the slash vortices here. Um, look at the kinetic energy of this flow. Now you take these vortices, uh, uh, I mean random microposition of vortices, look at the kinetic energy of the flow, which is created by randomizing the, the position of the vortices. The kinetic energy of the randomized flow is always larger, or tends to be larger than the kinetic energy of the of the of the real flow, okay. And you can you can uh, you can see this here. This is the the difference between the energy of the real flow minus the energy of the scrambled flow, uh, and this is always negative. This is zero here. This is always negative. And it's something. It's an effect that you, you need all these vortices to rearrange them. I mean, to be able to rearrange them. But you when the board when the flow decays, and you get fewer vortices than this. This effect. Is less clear, but you still get something that is negative. The vortices are clearly, clearly, uh, uh, I mean, getting rid of energy. This is what they are trying to do. And how do, do, do they do it? Well, they screen each other. Screening is a is a is a concept that is typical in statistical mechanics, and it's, it's, it happens a lot in in flows or in fluid that have charges, electric charges, okay? Basically, you have a fluid with electric charges, you have an electric charge here, and because you have an electric charge there, an ion, say, then uh, the, the, you, you have a, an energy associated to the, to, the flow, to the field, to the electric field of this ion. But the flow is, is neutral, the same thing happens with, with vortices, uh, and the, the, the total circulation in one of these periodic boxes has to be zero. And then this was positive, Charges uh, attract the negative charges, and then they essentially tend to cancel each other. They don't, they, they don't really need to, 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 to cancel each other, but they, 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 they really increase the energy. Because when you look at them from, from far afar, those two vortices are not there. Sorry, those two charges are not there. But the same thing happens with vortices. This is something that was proposed or was a conjecture by, by the Virgil. Uh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, I mean, some, some, some time ago, I've never been really observing turbulence. Some people have looked at things that look like, look like, look, look, they have never been seen like turbulence, but here is very clear. What you see here is the correlation of the circulation of, of the different large vortices, okay? For example, you, you take here two large vortices, and this, this, this has a circulation here, circulation there. You look at the at the mean value of the product of these two circulation, you're looking for a correlation function. And it's something that has to be between minus one and plus one, okay? And this is the distance, this is the distance between these two vortices, you plot one against the other, and for turbulence, you get all these solid lines here that has a, a negative minimum, okay? Which is quite high, I mean, this, this is gonna be bigger than minus one and it's 0.4, so 0.3, so it, it is quite high, but basically means that you have a positive vortex there, you have a negative vortex there, and vice versa, okay? And this, again, is a property of turbulence. It's not a property of just having a random superposition of vortices of two sizes, because if you do the same trick, you randomize the, the position of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the vortices, then this minimum is gone, and you get something which is basically flat, okay? So this is, this thing is, to me, is the first uh, demonstration, the first, Experimental demonstration you want to you want to call an American experiment uh, an experiment which I, I do uh, of something which is a screening between uh, vortices of different uh, different signs. Okay, now how does this thing happen? Because you know uh, vortices don't attract each other. It's not like it's not like uh, like charges. Uh, positive vortices doesn't attract an anti vortices. So something else. Has to be happening here, okay? And uh, 
Well, something has happened, but first, let, let's tell me the, the next consequence of this, this question of uh, if I am a positive vortex, I need a negative partner, okay? Because this negative partner also needs another positive vortex, then the whole thing has to be organized uh, somehow, and it organized into something that looks like a, a random crystal. Uh, you can call it a uh, stochastic crystal or something like that. And the way that to see that this is a crystal, this is more organized and random, is to do this uh, boronoid desolation of the plane. Basically, you take, you take your vortices, substitute them by uh, the center of gravity, and then uh, distribute the plane into things which are the nearest neighbor of each point. This is called a boronoid desolation. Each point in this square here is uh, closer, closer to this point than to any other point in the, in the, in the flow field. And uh, not all of these uh, near neighborhoods have the same size, they have the same size, the same area, but you can do a PDF of the areas of these, of these things and you get something that looks like, is that a Gaussian, of course, is positive, okay? But it looks something that it looks, looks like this. And you compare this as doing the same experiment with a random set of the same number of points, the, the random set is wider, so this, this turbulence is more organized, it's, it's, more, it's more crystalline than the random uh, superposition of vortices. If, if this was a real crystal, if this were uh, really completely organized, it would be a delta function. It's not a delta function, but it's, it's narrower than a than, 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 than delta function. So we have a vortex crystal. That looks very spectacular, but it's actually quite, quite common. Vortex crystals are, are found in many, in many cases. Even if you tend to associate crystals to turbulence, uh, sorry, vortices to turbulence, they, they tend to be quite, quite, quite organized. They're probably the best organized. The, the most common thing is a, a Kármán vortex street. You know, you have a here, a, in this case, it's an island, I think. Then this thing has a wake, and then you, you create vortices, and the vortices fall into place, and then they, they stay in that relative uh, position for a long time. Yeah, basically, it's uh, basically a vortex crystal. This is the, the North Pole of Jupiter, and there is an hexagon there. Such like this is also in the, the North Pole of Venus. Okay? Uh, it happens in plasmas, and it's happening to, in four two dimensional turbulence. And I have known that, known that for, for, for some time. Excuse me. But this is different because basically, this thing has crystallized because it has been forcing it for a long time. Okay? This is a uh, time. 10, 10, 10 into infinite uh, limit of two dimensional turbulence, you, you, you force it. You see here, you see this small scale granulation here. Okay, This is a forcing. And the energy has been going to a large scales and it has ended up in this very regular uh, lattice. And in this case, it's a regular lattice. Okay, For that, you need to do something about the energy that is trying to go to the size of the box. You, have, you need to put some dumping there, but depending on the what you do with the dumping, you create uh, different lattices, but you always end up with a, with a, with a crystal, okay? So crystals happen. The, the thing that I find interesting is that not only crystals happen when you give it a lot of time. Jupiter has been there for a few million years, and these things are essentially steady state. They rotate, but they are, they are, they are, they are steady state. The camera and Bortus Street is also something that is a, a short-term crystal, but this, this uh, decaying turbulence, these crystals form very fast and they stay there more or less organized for, for the lifetime of, of the decay. Okay. So how do you study this? I mean, how do you get down? I mean, what is this? Is this a property of the vortices? Is this a property of turbulence? Is it a property of what? For that, you go back to, to the, another way of looking at two-dimensional turbulence, which is doing this point vortex approximation that um, that worry on Sager, that on Sager was looking. And essentially, you take your point vortices and for each vortex has a, a, a position, X and Y, and it has a, a circulation, which is this gamma Y. And uh, you can write a Hamiltonian, which is the thing with a log in there. And the thing inside the log is the distance between all vortex pairs. And then once you, you create this Hamiltonian here, then the, the equation of motion of individual vortices is, is the, are the Hamiltonian equations of this. That is this, this prefactor, which is the circulation, 
that you can absorb it either in X or in Y or whatever you like, okay? But it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a Hamiltonian thing, which is why you expect the uh, statistical mechanics to happen here, okay? And then you say, well, is this thing going to create a crystal? Well, okay, we had two, two diagnostics for the crystals in two rooms, okay? One was the screening, you know, this thing that whenever you have a positive vortex, you, the next partner you see is a, is a negative vortex, okay? And this is for turtles, okay? And then there was the, the size distribution of the tessella in the, in the, in the Boronoi the tessellation, the difference between the width of the distribution of turbulence and the width of the distribution of the, of the random of the, of the random position of vortices. So you, you repeat this thing for uh, this uh, evolution of the Hamiltonian system. You take the Hamiltonian system, run it for a long time, do a statistics, do the same um, correlation function of the circulation of the vortices, do the, do, do the same tessellation for the, for, for the vortices. And then you see that the point vortices do not crystallize. The point vortices are random, okay? The, you, you look at, this was the distribution of the circulation of turbulence. This was the, the distribution of the, of the random vortices. This is the distribution of the point vortices. The point vortices, the random, I mean, they don't see each other. They don't, there is nothing, there is nothing to say, to tell you, if you are a, a vortex, there is nothing to tell you what is your neighbor going to do, okay? The same thing, the, the distribution, the distribution of the size of the tessellas in, 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 the, in the Hamiltonian system is the same as, as, as in random, okay? Turbulence is turbulence. It has to do with the fact that the vortices are, uh, have a finite size and it has to do with viscosity. Viscosity is the real difference between this uh, Hamiltonian system and not Hamiltonian system. Actually, this is the, the thing that makes the, the difference. Uh, basically, when you have two point vortices, okay, you have two, two point vortices and they, they, they have different, they, they have different uh, signs, they create a dipole and they move like crazy, okay. This is, this, this is also true for vortex dipoles. I mean, vortex dipoles, you have vortex dipoles and it goes off, okay. When you have correlating vortices, no, finite vortices behave differently from point vortices. Finite vortices, they merge. Okay, and this is something that you, you I mean, you're all uh, fa uh, familiar. You have to point vortices and like, like, these two things are going to merge. These two things that were originally, these two things are going to merge, okay? These two things are not because they have different sizes, okay? So the correlating vortices merge, and the point vortices don't. And this has to be the difference between what the Hamiltonian system is doing and what the point, uh, what the turbulent system is doing. And if, if this were true, what has to happen is that when you look at the, the neighbors of a, of a vortex in turbulence, there has to be a correlating neighbor which is missing because it has been merged, okay? You look at what happens with, at the neighbors of this and you see there are so many correlating vortex, correlating neighbors, so many counter-rotating neighbors. There has to be more counter-rotating neighbor, neighbor than correlating neighbor because the Hamiltonian system is trying to, to, to get these neighbors together, I mean, all, all mixed together, but then the fact that you are you, you have like this finite size says, no, okay, no, if a rotating neighbor comes nearby, I eat it, okay? And this this happens, I mean, this is true. Uh, you have the same, the, the same field that I, that I showed you before. This is a triangulation of the point, of the vortex centers. This is actually the dual of the, of the Boronoi, uh, Tessellation. And if you look at this vortex, uh, there is, uh, it has a, a set of neighbors which are, uh, all the vortices which are joined to it by a single, by a single edge, okay? In this case, there are seven neighbors, okay? The mean value of the, the, the mean number of neighbors have to be six, and it's a topological fact. It has nothing to do with turbulence, but with point vortices, uh, you do the tessellation of, of anything in the plane, sorry, the, the triangulation of, of, of anything in the plane, then the mean number of neighbors have to be six, okay? But then you can count, you can go vortex by vortex and measure the mean number of neighbors. And of course, it's going to change. In some cases, it will be four, in some cases, it will be five, six, seven, whatever. And you can also count the, 
mean number of of neighbors of the same sign, mean number of neighbors of, of opposite sign. And you, when you look at the PDF for the number of neighbors, you get something like this that has a mean value of six. Okay. When you look at the number of correlating correlating neighbors, the, the, the distribution is this. Counterrelating neighbors is this, and you, it is clear that the number of counterrelating neighbors is, 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 is bigger. Okay. You have more counterrelating neighbors. There's a correlating neighbor that's missing, and it's actually one, because then when you look at the at the the mean value of this distribution, this distribution, and this distribution, and do it for different times and different payment numbers and different flow fields and different cases. You get a mean number of counter counter, counter rotating uh, neighbors, which is 3.5, and correlating neighbors, which is, which is 2.5. So you get a, a reasonable idea of what is happening here. Then you have these vortices which are merging, okay? And the uh, when they are merging, they're getting bigger, but this is not the inverse cascade. The inverse cascade is something much bigger. Uh, by merging each other, they're organizing themselves into something like this, that will be like a crystal, and this crystal is the, is the, is the, 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 the inverse, the, the, sorry, the, the, the inverse cascade. The formation of this crystal is the inverse uh, cascade. Now the question is, why did they do it this way? I mean, uh, certainly you can, sit down and look at two-dimensional turbulence and say, well, let's look at whether there is a, a large-scale uh, collective structure in this. You can, but they have never done it in, in 20 years or 30 years that they have been looking at two-dimensional turbulence. And actually, I know of nobody who has done it. And this is why playing with a computer is nice. You see, the, the thing is, okay, this is the classical way of doing science. And now I, I go to the second part of my talk, which was, okay, I told you about this collective structure, and now how do you find it, okay? Well, okay, the, the classical way of finding it is this. This is the classical uh, scientific method. This is what we are taught in the school, okay? You pose a hypothesis, okay? You do experiments, collect data, test the hypothesis, if the, if the if the data uh, confirms your hypothesis, then you are done. If, the, if it doesn't, you improve your hypothesis and go blah, blah, blah. This is the, the way you do it, okay? Uh, it's just like this. I mean, when you look at the, what you're trying to do, you're trying to optimize knowledge. And the, there is a, you have here the, the, the space of your models, basically, the space of your hypothesis, which will be these two, two dimensions here, okay? And uh, there is a knowledge uh, landscape which basically says that some hypotheses are better than others, okay? And then you start somewhere, your hypothesis is not very good, you test it, uh, observe it, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't work, you know, improve your hypothesis and climb this hill until you reach a point in which uh, Changing the hypothesis doesn't do any good anymore and say, okay, well, I'm done. This is the best hypothesis I can get. This is a paradigm and you write a textbook and move to a different problem or do whatever you want, okay? This is the, the classical way of scientific exploration. The problem with this is that you have no, no guarantee that the knowledge landscape looks like this. It's probably more like, I mean, something like that. There are several paradigms, there are several hypotheses which are, which are useful, okay? You have chose, you have found one, okay? This one that is your paradigm, but there's another, another one here, another one there. So how do you find these ones? Or how do you improve your, uh, your chances of finding this other optima here? Well, basically you do Monte Carlo, okay? Basically you don't post one hypothesis, you post many. I mean, you're, you know that most of them are going to be junk, but you post many because you have a way now of testing hypothesis which is cheap, okay? So you, you use your infinite fast computer or your fast computer to test all your uh, hypotheses. And all your hypotheses where, in this case, something like, uh, well, this particular structure was going to be important for the future of the flow, and it was done, okay? So you, you, you do this, correct data, and then instead of uh, Posing a hypothesis, you choose the hypothesis that, that, that works better. Okay. 
So you do translate this, okay? You do Monte Carlo, and Monte Carlo randomly uh, give you several ways, several starting hypotheses, and then you test them all. You have to start. Remember these two years that I told you, I, I thought for, for two years, okay? This is a standard way. Now I have to climb the hills. Basically, I mean, this is not so strange. When you look at all the classical histories of the history of science, how the big discoveries of science uh, were done, there was always a Monte Carlo seed somewhere. You know, there was an apple that fell on top of, of Newton's head, or people thought that there had to be an apple falling into, into Newton's head. And then you pop, 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 say, okay, well, an apple, man, it's to a paradigm, okay? Or there is a, a petri dish that keeps open and uh, you are left open and you get something like this, or there is a uh, um, for, uh, for photographic plate as is left in a in a in a the drawer with radium and it gets fog. There's always a, a chance. And then of course what the scientist does is improve on that chance. Well basically this is a you you can think of this as a as a natural selection of ideas. And what Monte Carlo telling you is 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 giving you is is um, improving the rate of mutation so that you can get better ideas faster. In this particular case, what, what, what happened? I mean, what was the, the, the new paradigm from my point of view? Okay. Well, of course, you have something about two, two dimensional tournament, but to me, it was more personal if you want. I have spent a long time looking at looking for coherent structures because I know that coherent structures in many cases describe the flow wave. Okay. For example, you have here. Um, this is a cloud, I mean, this is atmospheric uh, convection, and you, you know that cloud, the storm clouds are important. You see the same thing here in, in two dimensional turbulence. You, have, you see here your structures in the, in, the, in the wave. You have here streets in, 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 a, in wall number turbulence, all the ways, uh, things like that, okay? And when you, when you look at how much of the flow, how much energy, or how much uh, the flow is explained by this uh, structure. 60% is, is a typical number. Between 50 or 60% of the kinetic energy, for, for, for example, for the Reynolds stresses in, in world water flow, is explained by this thing that you will call coherent structure. Okay. So this is nice, okay? This is nice. The coherent structures are, they, 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 they control themselves, okay? The fact that they control themselves, that means that they are that there, they, that you can observe them. It also means that you can really act on them. I mean, you can erase these vortices. So it takes a lot of uh, a lot of energy because this vortex wants to be there. Once the vortex is formed, it wants to be there. And the same thing with these streaks. Of course, I mean, you can control the 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 the, the drag of of, of another layer by controlling these, these streaks, but it's going to be expensive. What you want to do, what you also what you also want to know, is which are the the causal structures, okay? Where is the other 40%? The other 40%, somewhere in that 40% has to be the trigger for these structures. And this is what Monte Carlo is, tends to tell you. I mean, in some cases we know, uh, for example, in these cases, if you have ever flown a plane, a light plane, you know that any place that is slightly darker than the, than the surrounding field is going to be, you're going to have a, a thermal top. If you, I mean, what is the trigger of these, the chemical hot uh, structures in jets has been known for some time, it's here somewhere. For uh, for wall bonded flows, we don't know, at least I don't know, or in, in the waves, you know that is the separation here. For Rodby waves, I, I really don't know what, what is responsible for the, where do the big storms, are, where, where are they created, okay? Uh, so this is, this is the, I mean, this is, to me, this is the, the interesting, the interesting thing that is happening now. We are, we are able to find these things because we have two computers and we can test many uh, uh, hypotheses. So let me go to the end, let me summarize, okay? Uh, there was one part of the, of the talk that had to do to measure turbulence. But it, 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 it found something that to me was, was interesting. I, I really didn't know about this large scale. And now I think I know about them. And it is, it's interesting for me that it was a discovery enabled by the computer, okay? 
And then there is this other part. Of, is there any, any future in this Monte Carlo science, this Monte Carlo approach of science? Well, I think so. I mean, basically, it is a way of enlarging the choice of hypotheses that you can use to create your science. It, it, it basically avoids paradigm law. In, this, in my particular case, it uh, allowed me to at least think beyond coherent structure, beyond coherent something else. Well, thank you. And I want to, to, to tell, but by, by the way, I'm looking for PhD students. OK, thank you. Is there any question? So thank you, Javier, very much for, for this interesting talk. Yeah, as you said, we can just open the stage for questions. So whoever wants just to ask a question, just uh, feel free to open your mic and uh, ask your question. Uh, you can also ask in the chat if you if you have. Uh, You're shy. Uh, huh? <laughs> yeah. No question. No, I can. Uh, well, I, I have a couple myself, but I give you the I give the stage to the presenters first to the to the participants first. So, ah, go ahead, okay. Christos. Let me let me start off. Uh, hello, Javier. It's Christos. Uh, a lot in your talk, actually, <laughs> so I'm not sure where to start with, but you, you, uh, some, you relate the inverse cascade to uh, this collective structure you found. Yeah. Uh, of course, the inverse cascade is an average one. As, uh, I guess it fluctuates all the time. There will be flux going down, flux going up all the time. So the collective structure is probably also somehow oscillating in time, or is it not? Well, yes. I mean, you have these, these long streamers and these long streamers, they... They break, I mean, they, they, they break, they, they reconnect, they, it's, it's, it's a, of course, I mean, it's a, it's true. So the collective structure is not there all the time? It is there all the time, uh, and at least at the beginning. I mean, at the end, there, is, there are only like two or three streamers, but at the beginning, there are like 20. Uh, not all of them are there all, 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 all the time. Sometimes some, some, some of them are there, some, some are long, some are short. It's still a large scale tour and flow, it's a tour and flow. Okay, I I assume that your I assume uh, your total circulation must have been zero, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, perhaps the same also in your point vortices. I don't know how you chose them. Perhaps it was also zero. Yeah. I mean, actually, half of them were positive, half of them were negative. Uh, yeah, do you have different behavior if your total circulation is not zero? In fact, the ones like your problem, I think, had all vortices the same sign. Uh, which one? I think from memory, the Onsager paper 49 that you mentioned had all the bodies at the same sign. I may be wrong, but was, so it was not. Secret. Well, no, you, you cannot have that. I mean, you, you, you have a, a periodic flow. The total equation has to be zero. You can do that. Oh, yeah, periodic, periodic flow. That's why I said that you probably have a circulation of zero. In this paper with uh, Gilan, I, I mean, 10 years ago or, or whatever, then the, the, final, the final crystal that was created in that case had all the all the vortices were positive and there was then a diffuse background or negative of negative vortices so are you saying of negative uh, and, and vorticity not negative vortices in, in this so case it was, sorry go on go on finish <laughs> but that, that, that was different because that, that was not a faint turbulent that was forced turbulent that was after a, an awful long time so, so you're saying that your results are fundamentally caused by your uh, boundary conditions being positive? Uh, being uh, periodic, excuse me? Well, the fact that the, the total circulation is zero uh, requires uh, periodic boundary condition, yes. Otherwise, uh, there, are things, there are things which are very weird. The total energy is infinite. For, for, I mean, for one thing, you, you have a, your... I mean, if, unless your total circulation is zero, your total energy is infinite. And then all your statistical mechanics is really weird. Okay, we can, uh, my last question is for, if you go to 3D, I mean, uh, you made a good point that your simulations are very fast. Uh, I said the number of seconds for a number of times. 
uh, in 3D it would be longer and perhaps more possibilities to try um, uh, to try things in your initial conditions to try to change the flow. Uh, I don't know, have you have you tried something that way? Uh, what do you expect to find? I, I have four uh, people doing that. Uh, Obviously, I mean, that? I mean, I, 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 I have four people, two doing, I mean, two working on on uh, on well bounded flows, on channel basically, two working on on ecotropic turbine. Actually, you know, it is it is uh, I mean, it is interesting that three turbines is not that much more expensive than two D turbines. Of course, each turnover is more expensive, but a lot of things happen in three dimensions in one turnover. And nothing happens in two dimensions in one turnover. So, if you, I mean, if you, if you, if you want to follow what happens in two dimensions, you have to run for 50 turnovers. If you want to, 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 to run something in three dimensions, one turnover is okay, and maybe two the, the turnovers is, is okay. After that, the flow completely forgets for the, 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 the initial condition. It's more expensive. Uh, so, that I, I invest uh, quite a lot in, in GPUs and now GPUs uh, are fast. So your first paper you said was uh, you used machine, uh, the, the computer, and it gave you the uh, conventional wisdom. What's the conventional wisdom in 3D you think that you might find? In, uh, in isotropic turbines, I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, the conventional wisdom there will be something like uh, vortices, you know, vortices. Uh, the, the, the worms are the, the seniors of turbines, as, as Keith Moffat said once, okay? Yeah. That seems to be true for the smallest case. It doesn't seem to be true for the largest case. Okay, I can tell you that much up to uh, up to what we are waiting. Uh, we, we are getting now. I mean, actually, this, this three-dimensional work has been presented now. It was this meeting in Delft in the spring, and we have uh, four four papers there, and three of them were three-dimensional three-dimensional tools. Okay, in uh, in channels. When you expect sweeps and, 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 and ejections to be important, that doesn't seem to be the case. Sweeps and ejections are the coherent structure that they don't seem to be the, the cause of things. So I, I don't want to monopolize my last question because well, you said the cause of things. When, when you said the cause of things, what do you mean? That you remove, for example, this vortex or, this, or, or something and then the flow after some time goes somewhere totally different. How do you determine that? How do you determine, how do you determine cause of things? Well, I, I basically do that. I remove or change this particular piece yes. of the flow, run it for a while and see whether something happens or not. And amazingly, that, that was one, I mean, one of the first things that I found that I, I, I found interesting. This is why the whole thing works. Because amazingly, in some cases, something happens, and in some cases, you remove a piece of the flow. Even if a piece of the flow where you see something that looks in interesting, and nothing happens. There are the structures which are completely stale and the structures which are important. When you say nothing happens, you mean that the flow remains the same. I mean, if you were to take the two velocity fields and take the separation and take the, uh, some kind that's, of that's normal. How, that, that's how I, I measure where something happens or not, I do that. I measure the norm of the, of the, of the, the perturbation. I think it depends on many things. It depends on the norm. I mean, the, whether, which, what norm that you use, it, it, it depends on how long you use, uh, how long you, you, you run it. And, but those, those things at some point, essentially you have to do many. I mean, you, you have to try many things. Thank you, Javier. I think I, ha I had enough time asking. I'm sure others will ask more questions now. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, may I ask a question which is actually partially related to, to what was the last point of Christos? Um, so in, in, your, in your conceptual picture, you talk about several different uh, paradigms. And uh, I ask myself, what if uh, a few of these paradigms actually may exist at the same time and they communicate with each other in the sense maybe you have two different... Uh, um, uh, the inter maybe it's the interaction of two different mechanisms which uh, somehow generates the flow. In that sense, you need two different paradigms to think about the same flow. Um, do you think that such an approach may lead to to unravel the, 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 the interaction between different paradigm thinking? Well, yes. I mean, for example, in, in, in 2D turbulence, 
as is I told you, I mean, that are two, two, two structures which are, import, which are important. They are the dipoles and they are the vortices. And you, you need both of them. The vortices yeah. are creating the two, the, 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 the four cascade, the dipoles are creating the, the, the bubble cascade. And of course, you cannot create dipoles without vortices. And uh, vortices do something else if they're not dipoles, you, you need it, everything. The idea is you have to look at all of them and forget about paradigms. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, the, this, yes, yes. Uh, but uh, for example, what you, I, I was thinking, for example, to the, to the picture in which you had uh, uh, the, the vortex part and the dipole part, which were kind of uh, very um, uh, well isolated. And uh, there was basically um, no additional structure created by the interaction of the two or uh, which could have uh, had, uh, let's say a third, uh, add a third element to the, to the dynamics of the system. Is this a picture which you think it's, uh, it's gonna hold in, uh, in uh, 3D or there will be- uh, Actually, even, 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 even in, in 2D, I know there is a third element. Yeah. I mean, just by looking at all the possible templates, I mean, essentially what you do, since they, I mean, the way that you do this, is you, or, the, or the way that I do this is I, I try, a, uh, I mean, I break the flowing pieces, I perturb the thing piece by piece, okay? Look at what happens, and then do a, do a, a list of things where something happened and a list of things where nothing happens, okay? And then do a, basically look at the properties of those pieces and do a um, large scale clustering. Right? This is basically data, data science, if you want, okay? Data science on the, on the result of, of this, this experiment, okay? And uh, in principle, there are several clusters. And there are several clusters. Some of them are, are dipoles. In some of them, it's a, a cluster where you see pieces of flow that look like dipoles. Another cluster in which you see pieces of flow that look like isolated vortices. Pieces of flow in which there is this thing which is a funny tripod. I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't really know what, what it means, but it's there. In, a, I mean, for example, in, in, in shear float, in, 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 in cold bundle float, there are the, the obvious things. I mean, the, you can either see the center, I mean, a, a street, you see the, the edge between streets, mm -hmm. okay? You see sweeps and, 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 and ejection. They're all important, but some of them are more important than, than others, and some of them, at the end, what you end up, uh, I mean, big people are starting to do this now as networks. So you see these things as networks, a network mm -hmm. of different uh, medioids. And I'm, I'm quoting a, one of these terrible names that people give to, <laughs> to, data, to data structures. <laughs> <laughs> a network of different medioids, <laughs> which is a network of different clusters. <laughs> Things go from okay. vortex to dipole and dipole to whatever it is, a dipole and dipole to vortex and things like that, okay? Okay, 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 thank you. That's, no, but there, that's... I mean, there's a, a lot of things. I mean, the, the, the thing that I like about this is, is like almost starting again. I mean, it's a new way of doing things. And whenever you have a new tool, it's always fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that opens up to uh, quite a number of possibilities. That's true, that's true. Um, uh, in, the, in the meantime, actually, we've got another question, but through the chat. And uh, the, question, the uh, participant is asking, am I right to say the formation of larger structures is an inverse cascade, even for 3D turbulent flows? An example for 3D flows? Oh, you mean the way there is an inverse cascade in 3D flows? We have looked for that a lot in uh, isotropic turbulence. And to me, there is not an inverse cascade in 3D flows. I mean, there is, of course, sometimes the things get bigger. You have two vortices, they, they merge and they get bigger. But there's not, there nothing like an inverse cascade. And I think that that has been tested several times. At least there is not a, a deep inverse cascade. When you look at what the, the energy is doing, I mean, for example, it goes from uh, L to L half and maybe L to, to L 
but it doesn't go from L to 4L. The, the relation between L to 4L is just very weak. Okay, it has to go through, through some, uh, uh, into some intermediate scale. Uh, we are not finding, well, actually, I mean, then, 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 there is a problem with temper cascading in 3D. I told you 3D is, is, is not very expensive. High run number 3D is very expensive. And when your Ari Lambda, the highest Ari Lambda you can go is 150. And the highest Ari Tau that you can go is 500. There could be an inverse cascade somewhere. And you, you don't see it. There has to be an inverse cascade. I mean, for example, when you look at something like a channel, uh, you see this very large scale structure, which are the size of the channel. The, the size of the channel and data of length which are of the order of um, 20 uh, channel widths, okay? Those things have to be formed somehow. And there is very, very suggestive evidence that they form by putting together the smaller things, okay? I, I don't know whether I want to call that an inverse cascade. It might be, it might be. This, this, this is that, that, that uh, I mean, that would have to wait until my next machine, basically, or somebody else's. Uh, I mean, big machine, we can do. But I mean, is that your question? I, I'm reading your, I mean, I, I opened the chat, I'm reading your, your question, Han I, I don't know what this is. Okay, it says, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, is there someone else who would like to ask a question? Like uh, you can just, um, yeah, uh, I think Chef Philippe. Yes, hi. Thanks for the very nice talk. So I would like to come back to your last points when you said that you want to uh, investigate the causal effect of uh, the Korean structures to understand something new, let's say, on turbulence. And in 2D turbulence, you investigate more the inverse cascade. And uh, But what would be, uh, if you would do it on, uh, on shear flows, on wall-bounded turbulence, what would be the mechanism that you would like to learn by this that you don't already know with the, the huge investigation that you have performed the last 30 okay. years? Okay, I'll this, tell you, may I tell you why I started with this? I mean, i tell you why that was the, one of my last theses. I mean, okay, this guy was looking at bursts, okay? At sweeps and, 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 and ejection. I think that we understand that now. I mean, sweeps and ejections are basically or or bursts, since that happens when the the structures get tilted by the shear, okay, then you can do the analysis of that and basically that that, that is starting growth. I mean, there's a, uh, the the scene starts very very weak here, and then as it gets uh, vertical, it uh, it gets stronger and then it dies. Okay, what happens here? How I mean, how do you get that? We, we try to get that by moving backwards from a burst. Okay, try, we see earlier and earlier and earlier, and at some point we get lost. We get lost because there is no, there is no statistics basically. The, the thing is, is far enough that we, we don't know, which is the configuration of the flow that has to happen for the next burst to happen. Okay, and this is, this, this is important because if you're going to control drag, you want to act there. You don't want to wait until the whole thing you have a verse that you know has half the kinetic energy of the, of the of the flow, and then you want to stop it. We we did that. I mean, actually, there is a paper coming in in JFM, but there was this, this postdoc who, who was controlling the large scale. Uh, she controlled the, the large scale. She was able to kill the large scale. The drag increase because you have to spend so much energy killing the large scale that the drag increases. Okay, so you want to, to know, the, this is one thing, I mean, how do birds start? This is something that I really want to know. Another thing that I want to know, in shear flows, uh, does causality go from the outside of the flow to the wall, or from the wall to the outside of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the flow? I don't know, and I want to know. So you, you think that it's better it, it's a better tools than uh, using, uh, for example, conditional statistics? And, uh, no, well, you don't have enough a, statistics. 
They, no, no, I mean, they, 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 this is a part of conditional statistics. They, this is they, this question, I mean, this, this whole question of whether correlation is causation or not. Correlation is not causation. I mean, if you see something, if you see, I don't know, I mean, assume that you, you see the night and day. This is a classical example, I think it was first put by, by Bernard Russell, or, I mean, somebody like that, okay? You look at conditional statistics and you look at day and you know that before day there's always night. Say, oh, the night is the cause of the day. Well, you can illuminate as much the night as, as, as you want and you will not darken the day and the other way around. This is, this is conditional statistics. Conditional statistics tells you that these things happen, but not why. Okay? This is not the cause. There's a difference between cause and, and, uh, and condition and, uh, and uh, I mean, conditional is, is statistics, and it's a very important difference. In one thing, it's something that you can you can act on the cause, and then something will happen to the effect. And in, uh, and, 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 and in other cases, you can act on the condition, and nothing will happen to the effect because it's not a cause. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, any more uh, questions? So once again, just feel free to, to unmute your mic or uh, you can write it in the chat. Uh, quiz. Okay. You see a role for deep learning tools in understanding turbulence and doing science in general. What are your expectations for deep learning for turbulence flow says in the, in the next 50 years? You mean my expectations? Okay, I mean, we're looking, and when I, I tell you between this slide and this slide, there's a lot of, 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 of statistics. Half of them are things with a name, with a thing with, with, you know, with, with an acronym. Uh, an, S, an, an SVM, a support vector machine, we use that all the, all the time. Clustering, it's a, it's a classical thing of, of, of learning, okay? We, we try to do, we, we try to use a neural network. I know people who use it. I mean, I, I have some of my students who are younger and they, they, they keep trying to use them all, all the time. They never give you, and they, they have never given me anything. You know, it is clear that Deep learning is a very nice way of doing something faster. It's not clear to me that it's a way of doing something better. And I am looking for something better. I mean, it's something that I don't know how to do. And deep learning tells you, once you know what is a cat and what is a dog, okay? Deep learning is, very, is I mean, it's, it's able to tell you what is, this is, is a cat, this is, is a dog, and it does it better than you, okay? Um, I don't know whether deep learning is able to tell you whether this is a portrait or this is a type of, well, certainly, if you, if you show the, the, the network many pointers, many portraits and many typos, you will find out. I was, I had some hope, you know, I mean, there is this, this uh, deep mind thing that is able to fold proteins, okay? And that, that, that looks hopeful. I feel that looks hopeful because it, uh, Apparently, it's able to fold proteins, which is a very hard problem. It's an MP problem. Um, much better than, than people, okay? You say, okay, well, this thing is well, that, that getting smarter, okay? Well, I, then I found out how it worked. It didn't really fold proteins after folding proteins. It was using proteins that, that, were, that were already folded. And then look for the new proteins because they look like the other ones. Okay? And it's able to, to do that much, much faster than you. Uh, my feeling is that up to now we don't have enough, enough uh, data in turbulence to really train a neural network. Whenever somebody has tried to do uh, something with a neural network, for example, I mean, a couple of years ago we were interested in the question of whether you can uh, detect. Coherent structures, large scale coherent structures in, in, in the lake from the water. 
change how they work, when you have these large scale coherent structures which are passing by. And the question is whether just from information in the world, you can uh, find out that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that the neural network, uh, sorry, that the, the structure is, I mean, passing by because we wanted to control it. I mean, it was part of this control, this control, this control question, okay? Um, there was one guy, not from my group, I'm happy to say, say, well, I will do this with, 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 with the neural network. There was another guy from my group who said, well, I'll do that with, uh, with a linear system. The linear system won by, by, by far, you know? Let's see. Neural networks, or something like a neural network, is a, is a, is a new tool. I don't know whether it's going to be something useful or not. I know that right now it's not very good for, for, for physics. Uh, whenever, whenever they see somebody saying that they are doing physics with neural network, they're not, okay? I mean, for example, we had a seminar in, in my group. Uh, I mean, last week, somebody was doing that. Uh, was trying to, was trying to, um, to, to, to understand the channels basically with uh, neural network. Uh, Network, canal, uh, network analysis of neural, of neural networks, okay? And it was full of black boxes, okay? I, I use a PDM and then pass it to, um, to, to an MVP and an MBA. God, I it didn't make sense at all. It was a bunch of, a bunch of, of, of acronyms, okay? There's a problem with, you know, even when you have a, I mean, there, there's no, there's, there's, there's no better, there's, I mean, for a while, there's not going to be a better neural network than you, okay? Your, your neural network is quite good. My neural network is okay. I mean, our neural networks are, 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 are okay. You wouldn't believe a postdoc if he tells you all oh, the, the important thing in world turbulence is uh, anti-clock vortices that you ask why. Okay, you cannot, up to now, you cannot ask us from a neural network until you are able to do that. To me, they're useless. They have to be able to be smart enough to be able to explain what they're doing. And up to now, they're not able to explain what they're doing. Okay, that, that's probably the point of view of an old man. Okay, any other question? I mean, is that okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry about your, your microphone. I cannot do anything about that. I mean, probably you can do that by going to the to the lower left corner of your of your screen, to the place where there is a microphone. There is a, a little arrow there that will open a menu. Oh, that's that's that's, that's even worse. I mean, you have no hardware, then you have no hardware. Okay, any other question? I, I think, uh, so uh, actually this question, you received it uh, in private form in the chat, right? Well, I, I just read in the, the chat, I don't think that's very private. I'm, I assume that everybody can, can open the, can, can open the chat, yes, but I'm talking with, uh, with Patil on the, on the, on the chat. Okay. Because apparently his microphone is broken. Well, he has no microphone in his, in his desktop. Okay, so it might be, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so maybe you can... Uh, oh, yeah, no, sorry. I mean, it, it, I, I just saw that he's, he's, he's not doing a, a, an overall chat. I mean, just directing this to me. And, so that's okay. I mean, did, did you still get the, the question? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. that was that was uh, you, you you mentioned okay. it. Uh, okay. uh, so just in case, uh, so uh, let's let's ask once again if uh, there is someone who wants to 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 ask a question and uh, just just once again feel free to open your mic or to write in the chat. Possibly do it uh, on the overall chat such that uh, we can all uh, read the question.
Okay. So to me, this doesn't seem to 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 be the case, right? Did you have you did you did no, receive no, any no, message? No, no, they, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. So I would say then uh, uh, thank you once again for for the for the talk. That uh, it was uh, very very inspiring, and uh, as you could see, it opened a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, thanks uh, thanks for having been part of uh, uh, the LMFL uh, fluid mechanics webinar. Good. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, uh, then I hope to to see you all uh, next week. Uh, have a have a good evening. Bye. Oh, bye. Thank you very much.